who's actually still awake? No. <clears throat> we'll, we'll try it. What we'll do, I think we'll use is we'll do the session, and then as you've all fallen asleep, we'll do the time travel back to the beginning and just do it all over and over and over again and get stuck in one of these little time loops. I think that sounds like fun. <clears throat> now, okay, so uh, let's do the actual session instead. Uh, <clears throat> as Gabrielle said, uh, my name is Magnus Hagender. Uh, in Postgres, I work on the core team, and I'm one of the committers. I also do a lot of work for Postgres Europe. I see a couple of people in here, at least, who are over from that side of the pond. Uh, when I don't work on Postgres community things, I work for a company called Red Pill Linpro, which is an open source services company, uh, and Postgres is one of our focus products. Uh, and I'm the you know, principal guy on all, all things database for some, some strange reason. Uh, <clears throat> our company is entirely based in Scandinavia, which is why I'm betting many of you have never heard of it. Uh, I'm based out of Stockholm in Sweden myself, uh, and again, doing sort of all things Postgres, consulting, support, training, and things like that. Uh, and this talk is actually coming out of, uh, more or less directly out of a customer project uh, that we did last year. <clears throat> so the talk is all about, say, a TARDIS for your ORM. So who in here is, actually, let's do this. Who in here considers themselves an application developer? Okay, quite a few, or DBA. Okay, and anything else? Okay, there's at least a couple. You don't count. <laughs> so probably everybody knows what an ORM is, right? It's the object relational mapper. It's how we, you know, application developers today do a lot of their database access. Uh, and presumably, who, who knows what a TARDIS is? I'm almost disappointed. Everybody should know. This is obviously the TARDIS, right? <laughs> um, as we know, it's a time travel machine. It does a lot of interesting things other than just time traveling. <laughs> but we're not going to focus on exactly on the TARDIS part. Uh, we're going to focus more specifically on just the time travel part. Uh, and in this case, we're going to look at application level time travel. Uh, I think there is actually another talk right at this conference talking about temporal support in the database, uh, which is sort of deeper down in the database layer. This is implementing something similar at a higher level in the system uh, where uh, we can do it on things that we have today. <laughs> so it's application level time travel, but it's still implemented in and on the database. So uh, in order to get going, uh, I'm going to start with a step back and just sort of look at what are the requirements? What were the requirements when we got involved in this project? So actually, initially, I, I had a bunch of people from a different department who do a lot of Java development uh, in our company who got into the project. And then they read through the requirements a couple of times. And then they came to me saying, can we do this in Postgres so that we don't have to try to solve this problem? Uh, the first parts are fairly simple. So one of the requirements was there is an existing data model and we'd like to prefer to change exactly nothing. Now we do have to make some small changes, but there is a general a very high requirement on minimizing the changes to the data model because this is an existing application. This is not a green level application. It's an existing application that we want to add this functionality to. So we need to minimize the changes. <clears throat> now what's contained in this data model is basically both detailed and statistical data. So there is a lot of data collected over many years. Uh, <clears throat> the customer is a government agency. Uh, this statistics contains very, very sensitive personal data, which leads to some of the more interesting requirements. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what type of data it is, but let's just leave it with the fact that it's really, really sensitive. Uh, and it contains data both at the very detailed level about individual people and then at, you know, step by step greater levels of aggregation uh, where we in the end have a lot of reporting and things like that. Uh, now data gets into the system mostly by being loaded in batches, which is true of most of this kind of system, right? <clears throat> I think there's like a four hourly batch that loads one type of data, a nightly batch that loads another type of data. So we don't have a lot of individual inserts. It's larger chunks of data that goes into the system. But there is also people who are working on manual corrections all the time. As these are entirely manual, they're done by the staff or at this agency. It's not a huge amount of them. Uh, it's not, um, the, in particular, there's not a lot of concurrency in this. They have like people who are working with the data who just notice that this data is wrong, let me go fix that kind of level. 
uh, or they pull out a report and it doesn't make sense and they have to go back in. Because the or origin of the data, some of it is very historical. Um, so obviously data entry wasn't necessarily correct. Some of it is manually added, even going into the systems that then feed it into this now. So there's a lot of manual work attached to the data as it comes in, so it's incorrect. Uh, so we need to fix it. So we have this one part of the system that's uh, getting the data in, loading in batches, and manual corrections. And then of course, we look at the data, we use it for something. Uh, without that, it would be sort of pointless. So there's a lot of things running like larger aggregate reports, these things that can run for a few hours and dump a report out at the end. Uh, <clears throat> but there are also quite a bit of like zoom in work where you're looking at I don't think they ever actually look at individual records. I don't think they're allowed to do that. Uh, but they look at like smaller groups of people and smaller or, or other statistical selections that leads to a small group of people. I do actually think they're not allowed to look at a single person that's against the rules. Obviously, it's in the database. If you have SQL level access, you can do it. <coughs> so this all sounds like pretty standard requirement, right? I'm sure you've all run into similar kinds of applications. But there are a few requirements here that uh, made it a little bit harder uh, when we looked at it purely from an application level perspective. One of them being that there is a requirement to reproduce incorrect reports. Okay, so we're correcting the data. We need to be able to reproduce the report before the correction. And we also need to run the report with the correct data. Uh, and at some point we may need to compare those two. Actually, surprisingly enough, that was not in the requirements being able to compare what actually changed in the report because of a correction. It was just the requirement to go back and say, this report that I ran back in October last year, how did it look from the source data? Uh, which at the core means we can't actually ever delete any data. And trying to do this without changing the data model from the application side uh, becomes really hard. Uh, there are some other challenges for example, we need to be able to go back and identify which reports contain data about a specific individual somewhere in the past. So which reports ran back in August last year that returned any kind of data about Stephen? Uh, luckily, this is not a performance sensitive thing. It's actually okay if answering that question takes two weeks. No, he's not. Stephen is never okay. So these are the things that are, are like database level challenges, right? We need to reproduce the incorrect data, which kind of feels wrong. Like there's a reason we corrected it. And we need to be able to run this identification of what actually ended up being returned. Now luckily we're not running you know, tens of thousands of reports every day. It's a fairly small group of people who are running the reports against a large amount of data. Now the other big challenge is we need to do this while maintaining application flexibility. So we need this not to be present at every point in the application. It's a fairly large um, Java application that has you know, reporting from a whole lot of different places. And it contains something that's interesting as a manual query interface. Because these are statisticians, right? They can input queries. Now they input the queries, they don't actually put them in SQL, <coughs> but they can partially put them in, uh, I think it's called HQL, uh, for those of you who know Hibernate. It's the, that's exactly my reaction as a few people here said, like, I don't like HQL, but you know, they're Java people. Uh, and they also have a simple UI where, you know, drag and drop fields and joins and things. And we need to deliver these uh, requirements for those queries as well. It's reasonably simple-ish, as long as you actually know exactly which queries run, but we don't. We can basically run arbitrary queries, and we still need to be able to do this. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the whole preferably we will do this with zero changes to the application. Obviously, that's impossible, right? Uh, it's not going to be zero, but we need to minimize it, and we need to minimize it as much as possible. Because also, we have you know, these multiple different teams working on the different parts of the application, and we all know how well uh, you know, cooperation of those things can work in, particularly in government organizations. I'm not biased at all. Uh, so the toolbox that we have here is basically we have JBoss and Hibernate. That's the part that we can't touch uh, because you know, the application already exists. Uh, <clears throat> now it helps us that they at least choose an open source framework to build it on, uh, and actually a fairly flexible one. As far as ORMs go, 
Hibernate is not that bad. There are many examples of ORMs that are much worse than Hibernate. Hibernate lets you do some interesting things. Now, but you can do this, I mean, the solution is actually independent of ORM. You can do this in most ORMs. But the one that we used uh, was JBoss and it was Hibernate. And we got the option to use Postgres. Originally, the system wasn't running on Postgres, but when we got involved, they were already thinking of moving it to Postgres. Uh, so we got to use that, which gives us the flexibility of using the whole set of tools that we have in Postgres. Now, if we look at the actual database schema of this existing application, it's a fairly simple schema because, you know, it's generated by an ORM. Those schemas tend to be fairly simple. It's at least an ORM sophisticated enough to know about the concepts of foreign keys. So we do have foreign keys in the system. Uh, we do have these things. So it's an ORM generated. It has quite a few tables. Uh, but there's really nothing difficult in the schema itself. Because, you know, Hibernate is designed to work on any database. So the original schema doesn't use anything Postgres specific. You know, it's integer, it's strings, it's, you know, date times, things like that. And some foreign keys, uh, but fairly simple. Now it gives us a couple of things that Hibernate does, at least by its default, that will make this solution easier for us. All tables live in the public schema. They don't use multiple schemas and they don't use fully qualified schema names in their queries. We're gonna exploit that. And all tables have an ID column with a serial attached to it. This is enforced by Hibernate. Actually, I think you can set up tables without that in Hibernate, but it does it by default. That also makes our life much easier. And the way it's been set up, the application has very few schema changes over its lifetime. So there's a lot of changes to the data, but new versions of their application itself generally doesn't change the schema much. Um, it changes the application layer. The schema is fairly fixed. There are changes to it, but that made us, uh, gave us the option to say that we actually can turn off and we will not be using Hibernate's ability to automate schema migrations. Just say any schema migrations will just require a DBA to extract the script from Hibernate, then run it and potentially adjust it uh, to work with our solution. <clears throat> so we automated the initial setup of our solution, but we didn't automate the incremental steps. We probably could have done that. It just wasn't a requirement, so we got, a little, got off a little bit easy. So based on that, how do we actually solve a problem like this? I'm sure most of you who've worked with databases for a while can figure out step one, right? Step one, we need to keep our old data around. We can't actually go delete it. How do we typically do that? Well, we store it in a history table somewhere. But what we need to do, which we don't necessarily need in, in like your typical auditing table, which is how we usually do this, is we store when did somebody change something. Now instead of storing that, we're gonna treat, keep a track of for every individual row throughout which time frame is this version of the row existence. So it's sort of like we have the multi-version concurrency control in Postgres. It's sort of that, but at an application layer. We say this version of the row existed from this period in time until this period in time. And then if you updated it, you get a new version that has a different validity period. And that way we can reconstruct the history of this row. So yeah, everybody, who does not know how our history table works? Okay, good, at least your database people, right? Who does not know what a range type is? Okay, that's more impressive, like one or two. This is clearly a Postgres crowd. <coughs> I've, I've asked that when you go to like, uh, say a JBoss conference, you're like, who knows what a range type is? And you get maybe one person who knows it. Uh, so what we do is basically, we do a traditional history table and we put a validity period on it using a range type. Uh, Query-wise, this is just like this. So for a table called table one, that would then, based on the previous requirements, always reside in the public schema, we just create a history.table one, always with the same name, that is exactly the same as public one, or as public.table one, but we add the column and we just call it underscore valid range to make sure it doesn't conflict if in case there happens to be a column named valid range in a table somewhere. That is a TSTZ range. That's the timestamp with time zone range. Now in 
fairness, I think there is also a not null on that that I forgot to get on the slide, but that doesn't entirely matter in this case. So who knew about the construct that you could say create table like and then also add more columns? Okay, that's quite a few. Uh, <coughs> it's good to know, it saves you a hell of a lot of typing. And it makes automating this much easier. Because I can just loop over all the tables and run this. Whereas if I didn't do that, I could do the same thing by you know, inspecting PG attribute and get all the different columns out and like recreate them on the other side. This is obviously much easier. But what like does is it copies all the columns as the definition is now. Uh, I've heard people who think it's different in that if you go after you've done this and you go back and add a column to public but table one, it does not appear in the like table in, in any way. So it's a snapshot of the table as it looks now, plus one column. And that's the part where we have to go in and manually do this. If we do a schema migration and we add a column to the old one, well, now we need to add it to the history table as well. Uh, and in that case, we're also gonna have to add it with any not null constraints removed. Otherwise, our historical rows just won't work. So we create these for all of them. Okay, for those of you who may not have used uh, range types very much, this is just a, an example output from uh, one of my test databases of this underscore valid range column. I took just the valid range column. Uh, obviously, you'd need more than that to make it useful. Uh, but this will show two versions of, I believe it's the same row, yep. Where you can see on the first row, that's the validity, starts at uh, February 17th at you know, 14, 49, 52, or whatever and it's valid until 14.50.06. And then there is a second version of this row, which is valid from 14.15.06 until infinity. Um, there's also the important thing to note that the start of the range type here has a square bracket, and the end of it has a regular bracket. Now that defines whether it's inclusive or exclusive, right? Is this exact timestamp, because that's exactly the same timestamp as we have down there, is that actually included in the range type? And in order to create our proper indexes and our constraints, we need to have one of them being inclusive, which is this one here, and one of them being exclusive, which is this one here. If we didn't do that, we'd have, if we were to look at the way the data, uh, or, or the data looked at this exact timestamp, we'd get both versions, and that's not good. That, that would give another interesting type of error in our reports, getting two versions of everything. Uh, so this is basically when we insert a row, like this is a row that's the current version always has a validity into the infinity. Because we insert it, or in this case we updated it at this timestamp, and if we read it now and don't say anything else, then that's the version that we're gonna look at. Uh, and then of course to make this to make sure that we get this right, we need an exclusion constraint. Uh, which is again, using this syntax, we end up having, this is where we can rely on the fact that there is an ID column in every table. So we're just, for each table, we're going through and saying, for this history.table1, add a constraint, called table1 exclusion in this case, exclude using gist, which is our standard syntax for creating an exclusion constraint, with ID, uh, sorry, ID with equals underscore valid range with double ampersand. It says for each ID value, so for each entity, so to speak, from the Java side, there cannot be any overlapping ranges of validity. That's what guarantees that when we look at this, whichever sort of val valid point in time we're looking at, we'll only get one version back. And if we had created this one with a square bracket on both sides, that constraint would not create because they would not complain that we have an overlap uh, between these two timestamps. Uh, <coughs> so this will guarantee that, and it will also give us an index uh, by which we can make fast searches if we include the ID field and a valid range with, with a valid operator. And as it turns out, you know, that's how Hibernate issues most of its queries. Um, it will look them up by ID, so if we can just specify, get a way of specifying it into the valid range, and setting the ID, it's going to work. Now to make this part here work, you need to install a contrib module called b gist but it's part of the standard Postgres packaging. It just needs to be, you know, create extension. Steven. 
it would be nice to fix that. We should just include that in core, but we don't right now. So right now you have to say create extension B3 just. It's not very hard. <coughs> it became easier once we got extensions in 9.1. Okay, so now we have a history table. And we have a main table, or actually we have a couple of thousand history tables. Uh, then, of course, we need an update trigger. Uh, this is our simple, we say create a trigger. We do it before insert or update or delete because we need to trap all these operations. On the table for each row, execute procedure, and we just decided to put the procedure in the history schema as well. Just log table trigger. Means for every row that ever gets updated or inserted or deleted, we're gonna run this code. <coughs> so what we basically have here is our public schema contains all the current data at all times. And the history table would contain all the historic data. So basically we need to track every operation on the current row and somehow create an entry in the history table to reflect the changes and to then to tag this with the time that we're at right now. Um, so I'm not gonna show you the actual create function statement because it's too long. But if we look through the actual code, this is a PLPG SQL function, that is this uh, history trigger. <coughs> and the first part is pretty simple, the insert trigger, right? We'll say if TG op equals insert, so if this is an insert, then basically as we insert it into the main table, we're also going to insert it into the history table. Uh, and we just say insert into history dot, and we copy the name of the relation, TG well name. Uh, and it's select dollar one point star, uh, where dollar one is gonna come from new down here, new being the version of the row that we just inserted. And then we just add a comma, so because this will contain all the columns from the original table, which we copied into the history table using the like syntax, and then we're gonna add the validity period uh, column, where we just say then the TSTZ range is a function that will take three parameters and return a range type for timestamp with time zone. The first is the starting point. When does this row first become valid? Well, that's gonna be now. That's right now. How long is it gonna be valid for? It's gonna be valid until infinity because we just inserted it into the database. It's the only version that exists. But if we start looking at the database the way it looked an hour ago, it didn't exist, right? So from right now until infinity. And then we add the final parameter is this inclusive and in exclusive part of the range type. So we're saying the, the left hand side, the start side is inclusive. It's from and including now until, you know, well, the, I don't think it makes much sense when it's infinity at the other end saying whether it's including or excluding of infinity itself because just before infinity is still infinity. Uh, and we just insert that using new and then we return it new. If we forget to do the return new, well actually if we forget it completely, it won't go in anywhere. If we do a return null, uh, if we forget it completely, we get an error. If we return null, it will go only into the history table. Now we did actually look at that initially to store the data entirely in the history table. But it turns out there are still, unsurprisingly, most reports, most things still run on what's the data like right now. So we keep the data in the main table as well as basically a performance optimization to making sure that uh, you know, we can fast access the current version of the data. Now it gets a little bit more interesting when we start doing updates. Uh, because, uh, well, so the first one is pretty simple, right? If trigger up is update. Uh, and what we're doing then is here, you see we can open a cursor selecting the valid range uh, from this history table for the same ID. This is the second part where we rely on the fact that every row has a unique ID column. That makes life so much easier for these things. So where for this ID, and we order it by the valid range descending. So basically this will get us the latest version that's in the history table. If there's 100 versions, we get the latest one. If we just inserted the row, we get the only version that's there. And then we do a limit one. Steven. No, we cannot check for just where it's infinity because the row might have been deleted. 
concurrently. So it, 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 we could almost do that. <coughs> anyway, so we had the limit one for update, so that we also, at this point, lock the row. And then again, using new.id, because we run this once for every row. And then we just fetch that into a temporary variable. Then we create a TSTZ range, so create a new range, saying the new validity period is from lower TT, so that's the, start, the previous starting point, until now, with the same reasons. And if that is empty, what that means is that somebody else already updated this row with exactly the same time, more or less, well, in, for the, within the, the restrictions that we have, that means we already updated this row in the same transaction. If that happens, we're just gonna overwrite that. Uh, so what we do in this case, is we delete the history entry. Because we're gonna be writing a new history entry soon. Whereas, if this thing is not empty, that means, okay, we now actually have a new validity period for this row. So what we do now is we go back to this current latest version of the row in the history, and we update it. And we change the valid range to be, again, a new timestamp range, starting at, so dollar one, going back, which is the lower of the previous one, meaning, okay, we don't change the starting point of the validity. If it was inserted an hour ago, we're gonna change it, it's still gonna be inserted an hour ago. But we change the end time to be now. So basically we're saying this version that's already in there, it used to be valid until infinity, it's now valid until now because we changed it. Not if it's a new, no, not if it's a new transaction. Yes, you could, so if you, this is where we get into the point, we don't have a high concurrency on the updates. So. No, we, do, we, don't, we don't have to worry about that part. Now we can actually, and we have in, in we do have a, a slightly more complicated version of this that also checks the TXID. So you can do that. I explicitly excluded that version from the slides because it's longer, but we do have a secondary check in here actually based on TXID, um, but we, because we initially thought it was fine. And it was actually fine in production, but it wasn't fine in testing. <laughs> we broke it in the unit tests. Yes. You mean this row? Yeah. I had to cut this procedure, yeah, I had to cut the procedure into two slides. Okay. So once we have updated the old row and set the validity until now, we also need to copy in the new version of the row with an insert, so we get a second row in the history table for the same thing, where we insert all the data and the new valid range starting from now until infinity. Because yes, we do need one of the old versions and one of the new ones. And again, we need to specify this one here, so that the previous one ends on the regular bracket, the new one starts with a square bracket, so that we get no gaps. Where am I missing the single quote? So in X2, you go back to the history and the slides. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> that is correct. Okay, so yes, there should be a single quote over there because execute takes a string. Yeah. Thank you. I will tell you that's typo is only in the slides uh, sure. <laughs> because it wouldn't actually work otherwise. You wouldn't be able to do create function otherwise. Yes, we did. Uh, there were arguments for and against, uh, in particular in being able to update the function and how and, and getting this done with people who are very uncomfortable using database interfaces, <laughs> aka Java developers. <laughs> I mean, no offense to any Java developers in the audience. <laughs> if you are here, you're probably not one of the Java developers who don't like databases. <laughs> uh, but there are certainly those. 
And then in the end, we do return new so that we actually let this change happen on the master table as well. So the update gets tracked on the master. Uh, and of course, there's one operation left. Delete is very similar, of course, to an update. Um, what we do here as well, if the operation is delete, again, we do an open cursor. This, this is exactly the same query, so we get the latest version. That's in there. Um, again, the interesting case here is if this timestamp range, which is again the same one as before, do we already have an update at this exact time? That means that somebody did first did an update and then did a delete. For those of you who are not used to ORM applications, you'd be surprised how often this happens. So I've seen cases where it does like 10 updates and then deletes the row all in one transaction, which is kind of pointless. But you know, it's what they do. So we do the same thing here. If it's already been updated but has now been deleted, we're gonna delete this updated row because you know, transactionally it's never gonna have existed at the end uh, because we committed everything at once. Uh, and if we actually need it, uh, or if we actually did the delete, it's a new one, all we do is we found this last row and we update the last row and we set the valid range. Well, it's the starting point is still $1, lower TT, but it's now valid until now. So it's no longer valid until infinity because we deleted it. So it's valid until right now. Uh, so basically a newly inserted row will have a validity from insert time until infinity. When we do an update, the new row, the new version will have an validity from now until infinity, and we change the old row to be from infinity to right now. And as we delete them, we just say, well, it's not valid anymore. We don't like this guy anymore. And then we do return old. Uh, and that's one of those things that tend to confuse some people. Uh, yes, on a delete trigger, we have to return old because there is no new version of the row because we deleted it. Again, we could return null and then we're just gonna block the whole operation, but we want the current version of the data to be materialized in the table itself. So now we have the data. Now we're actually keeping our historical data. Yes, yeah. Uh, so there are kind of three options. Um, uh, so you can specify uh, the history table variable, uh, which is Yes. So yeah, you, we could have a version wh which had just the latest version would only exist in the current schema, and all the previous versions alone would be in the history schema. With this one, we keep both the current and the history in the history. Uh, the main reason for that is it's much easier for the application to query, because now it doesn't actually, you can input a timestamp whether it's within the current or not. The application needs to know less if we do that, or our view creation can be simpler. You could, but they become a lot more complicated. <laughs> it's not, well, not easily because the history has multiple versions in it. I guess you could have implemented that on top of a history, like one partition for all the old and one for the new, but then you'd still need a view in, in that hides the, the actual time validity. Look at both tables. Yeah. I, I don't know. We didn't look into that in detail because we looked at how it would affect the application side, and that was enough to say that we're not going to do that. I, I am not sure that we would. No, yeah. it might well be a, a real performance hog. So, accessing this data. It's fairly simple. Uh, anyone who's worked with the range types know the syntax, right? If I want to look at this, you know, I just specify the time, I say select, you know, ID in this example, I have columns A, B, and C. I don't know why it highlighted that guy. Um, from history, where ID equals 42 and valid range, 
and then we have the at greater than sign, which says, you know, give me the version where this timestamp with time zone is inside the valid range. And the exclusion constraint that we created promises that this can be zero or one rows, right? The, it can never be more than one row. It can be zero if we ended up after the row was deleted or before the row was inserted. Uh, but we'll always be able to do that. Now this got us, I mean, we can just put this in the application, right? And we're basically done. Unfortunately, that doesn't really fall under minimum modifications, modifying every single query that's done anywhere in the application. That is not very minimum. It is sort of what their developers had considered doing uh, before we got involved and, and got starting, uh, you know, seeing what you really do. Because in particular, when you start doing this and doing joins on top of it, you have to like qualify all these validity checks against all each individual table. It does work, right? It, the query just massively explodes. And if you're putting that in your database, nobody's gonna be happy. So we're gonna fix that at the database level. And we're just gonna do, you know, create schema time travel. Because for some reason they didn't like us calling that schema TARDIS in the actual production release. <laughs> so we're gonna create an idea. So we have a public schema that has the current data. And we have a history schema that has the whole history. So we're just gonna create a time travel schema that contains nothing but views. Uh, and each view is gonna look like this. Create time travel dot table one, which is the same name of a table as select. And we do actually expand the names of the columns here because we don't want to include the valid range column. Because this view is gonna look exactly like the table, not the history table. But we select it from the history table and we just say where valid range uh, at greater than, and to get the timestamping, we use a custom guck. So we just create, we invent a parameter that is called history.timestamp. Current setting, we'll just read the current setting in our session of history.timestamp and cast it to a timestamp with time zone. If there is no setting, we don't have that guck set, this is just gonna give us an error. So basically, this view requires the application to set the value of history.timestamp. But once you've done that, this one controls the time in which you are looking at the database. And you can join these views, and you'll get this sort of the, the exploding query with many, many validity checks, but it all gets auto-generated. Right? Uh, and what we then do is we set the schema search order to control whether we're looking at public or history. This is where we initially, at some point, we ran everything through this time travel point and realized we're paying quite a bit of performance overhead for the case when we're actually looking at the current version of the data. Uh, so that's why we also uh, made the application actually talk to the main schema. So when we just connect and run a query, we'll get the current version because it's in public. That's what our ORM is doing. And to enable time travel, what we really need to do is we need to do set the search path to time travel and then set history.timestamp to this value and do a select star. And that's the way this table looked at you know, the 7th of March at 1432. Uh, and to continue on, that's the same result. But if I then just change it to 1429, so three minutes earlier, you can tell I was not running this on the production database uh, when I was building the slides. And we can see it's the same table, but the row is looking different because we had an update obviously happen in between this. And that's sort of the core of it is the application needs to switch its schema and set the timestamp. And when it's done, you can do reset all and you're back to looking at things the way they're looking right now. Which is of course the reset all, don't forget to you know, configure your connection pool to actually do that. Interesting things can happen if you don't. Because another session gets your connection back, which is like time travel back to August last year. And you know, that's an interesting result. Uh, so what we basically get is automatic time travel, right? Once we inject these variables. We do need to do, do that. Now exactly how we do that is of course gonna depend on the framework. Uh, you can do it driver level. We tried a bunch of different things. I'm not gonna tell you those parts in detail because I don't really know Hibernate that well and I don't really want to know Hibernate that well. Uh, but we did some different examples. You can inject it at the driver. Basically, uh, at one point, we created our own driver uh, and injected it there. We can wrap individual queries. 
we can wrap it in a function call. Um, we tried a few different ways. So just an example of, of how we did the driver injection part is basically, uh, for those of you who love Java, right? We, this one is, well, that used to be the company name, uh, postgres.driver, and we just create our own driver that extends the original driver. We override the connect, and we call a little function called inject time travel, which will run these set commands on it. Uh, of course, yeah, this is simplified, right? That's not quite enough code. But you don't need to do much. <clears throat> you just need to trap those two things and then using annotations or whatever to actually set the time. Uh, in some cases, just passing, instead of calling, you know, execute SQL or whatever it might be called, you might just exec you know, execute SQL time travel, include a timestamp. So there needs to be an interface for it. But the advantage is the main OLTP app that does all the corrections needed zero changes. And the reporting app basically needed to add a field where you could input the time, and then we need to capture that and inject it in. And then we could run exactly the same Java code that we ran before. And we'll automatically get injected for the, the Hibernate language queries as well. Um, so it did all those. Now, there are, again, there are a few things to consider about that. <laughs> you know, don't forget to reset it. <laughs> Weird things happen. Uh, and query the public scheme of recurrent data. Once you get a bunch of versions and a lot of data, that's a very efficient optimization. Like, don't pay the overhead of going into the history scheme if you don't have to. It was when, when looking at that's when we decided that, yeah, we're actually going to materialize the current row in two different places purely as a performance optimization because it does make quite a bit of difference. Uh, and of course, you know, it depends also. The one thing that this, the automated system does not set up for us here is indexes. Right? It only set up the index on the ID. Any searches on anything else would actually by default only use the index on time and nothing else. Now for a number of reports that was fine because we didn't have the same level of performance requirements on the reporting. For some, you could just go in and manually create that index. Or, well, manually would go version controlled and all that stuff, but um, you do need it. We didn't try to auto-generate like time travel indexes for every single um, index in the system. That just seemed unnecessarily complicated. Of course, this covers all except that one last requirement. Identify which reports contained a person. Now this is the part where we don't have quite as nice a solution. Um, I think the solution can best be described as brute force. Um, so to do that, um, we log all queries. All select queries are logged. Uh, and then we rerun the reports to verify which data. So basically if the question is, which queries that ran through August actually return data about Steven, we're just, just gonna rerun every query that we ran in August and see if they include Steven. So this is slow. There are some heuristics. For some of the reports, we know how to like short track some things and make it more efficient, but that's sort of at the very base of it. And that's actually acceptable, because this is something that, frankly, they expect to never have to use. But if they do, having this take a couple of weeks is perfectly acceptable. Yes? So it's slightly unrelated to the time travel part, but uh, no, you don't, well, you need to probably, if you want optimization, you need to run it manual because you might be able to say like, this whole set of queries cannot be there. But as long as you rerun it with the same parameters, it's gonna return the same data. So yeah, the brute force method is just rerun everything. Yes. Yeah, so if you have like deep, they have, it depends on which level the aggregate is at. So yes, you're gonna have to adjust some of the things. Because uh, some of the, re I mean, the reports that actually return, you know, aggregates over a million people are never gonna have this requirement. Because nobody cares if Steven was included in that. The problem comes if Steven is included in a report that returns like 10 rows. Because he's probably identifiable within those 10 rows. Uh, so yeah, that's, there, there is manual stuff involved in when you get to this point. Like you need to do some, some thinking about what, what's actually represented. Uh, but the main thing is we needed to keep all the required data. And really the only way to know who looked at something is to record all the queries. Well, the, no, the other way would be to record all the responses. And that would have been much more data, as in much more data. 
uh, materialize every single row ever returned from the system just doesn't really scale. Uh, so one other word of warnings around this is ORM level caching. Uh, Hibernate does caching at two different levels. Uh, query level or entity level. If you actually have that enabled, very interesting things can happen because you can get back different rows from different times. Basically, you need to just either turn that off, which is what we did, or you need to make it aware of the time travel and like key it, including the timestamp. But uh, you can't leave it on in default mode. That will give you really, really funky results. Uh, <coughs> so I think the first conclusion may be the best one here. Like anyone who's not used range types, you, you probably have use cases for them. You just haven't figured them out yet. Uh, of course, we could have done this without range type, with just regular start and end times, but it would have been so much more complicated. Yes, much of the code is auto-generated, but it would still have been so much more complicated. Uh, range types are great. And we can actually you know, trick ORMs in a lot of cases so that they're, sim they're so simplistic that they're easy to trick. Like if the ORM actually made it easier to spread your data out across multiple schemas, this would have been much harder. Now we knew everything was there. The ORM gave us the requirement that there will be an ID column everywhere. Okay, so let's exploit that and then trick the ORM because Hibernate itself can run like perfectly exactly normal as it did before, having no idea that this happened once you manage to inject these things. Uh, and I think it's a good example of like the flexibility of Postgres that lets you really take this problem that trying to do this at the application level, I mean, you could do it, but it would not have been minimally invasive. It would have been many, many, many thousand lines of code. This is a fairly simple way to solve what's actually a fairly complicated problem. So if you haven't already, look into range types. That's good fun. And you know, it's fun to trick the application developers, especially the ones who aren't here. Okay, well, I'll thank you very much, and I think we have time for a couple of questions, yeah? Yes. Uh, so statistics on inserts and updates, uh, we are, there were some impact. It was surprisingly low. Uh, in, in the initial benchmarks, people didn't think it was working. Uh, because the thing is, we're adding this, we're not adding any more commits. Uh, it kind of shows, like, because the, the problem is that we're limited by number of commits in the benchmarks, and it doesn't add any more commits. It adds more data. Uh, so actually, the insert and update speed uh, were barely affected at all. It was less than 5%. Now, query speed, when you go into time travel, will drop, obviously, because we're looking at much more data and, and we've got more complicated queries, but insert and update were surprisingly low. I would have expected more. I think we had, I don't remember what we had, the but the requirement allowed for quite a bit of slowdown, like 30 plus percent, but it was nowhere near uh, that requirement. Yes? Um, Transparency to the application, um, complete transparency, in, in that the views look exactly like the tables, um, and that was one of our, our original requirements in, in making it simple and, and like making the application devs more or less not have to care. And in particular, those statisticians who actually input the queries need not to know at all. That was the main reason. Yes. No, actually, part, we, um, given that we know we're not going to have a huge amount of updates through them, we're not currently in a position where we even had to start thinking about partition. Um, partitioning them, I guess you could probably partition based on validity time, but again, I'm not entirely sure how smart the optimizer is in figuring out sending the queries to the right place, but it also depends on why you're partitioning. If you're actually partitioning for the access or if you're okay scanning five partitions every time of, on, when it comes to old data, you just need partitions for you know, vacuum or something like that. Uh, you could also partition based on ID uh, because almost all of these tables, I mean, they have a, a uniformly increasing ID where some rows are deleted, but in the history table, they're never deleted. They're always gonna be there. Okay, anyone else? Uh, slides are not available yet, but slides will be available on uh, that website? Uh, the code itself is not open source, uh, unfortunately. 
the parts that are on the slides obviously are, and actually just the other one is basically, it's just a loop that runs the create table and create trigger statement on every uh, statement. The, the only part that would be useful that is not either in these slides or trivial is the injection code in the Java side. And that's unfortunately not our property at all. So that part we can't help you with. Yes? Yes, if there was significant schema updates, there would definitely be a, a significant uptake in, in DBA things. If we were looking at a lot of schema updates, we, you would have to script that side. Uh, it depends on what they're, I mean, adding a column to this is very simple. You just need to remember to add it to the other table and then alter the view. Things like changing data types of a column would be really, really hard because then, then the whole thing would sort of fall back. You'd have to switch to a different uh, type. So that would be very hard. Uh, but just adding columns is fairly simple. Okay, with that, I am out of time. So thank you all very much.